up, everybody? Welcome back to class. This week, we're going to wrap up my lecture series, a really long PowerPoint I have that I've broken down into little segments all on 1942, which was kind of that midway mark of World War II, the year that everything kind of hung in the balance and it seemed like the war could go either way. Now, last week, we talked about a lot of events playing out in Europe, looking at the European theater and the war uh, through 1942. And we talked about in the home front, uh, Japanese internment, that really controversial thing where Japanese Americans basically were locked up because they looked like the enemy. Uh, this week, <clears throat> we're shifting gears and we're going to look mostly, at least for the next couple of days, we're going to look at the Pacific theater of the war and see how that was playing out in the early months of 1942. Now, let me get on to the next slide here. So, the start point and where you're gonna, what you're gonna take notes on today, I would put in a little heading that's the Battle of Midway. Now this is kind of conveniently named for uh, several reasons because Midway is actually an island out in the Pacific. And as you might guess or reasonably deduct, Midway got its name because it's midway out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So it's a midway point in the ocean. Also, kind of conveniently for us, the Battle of Midway is kind of like midway through all of World War II, okay? Kind of a middle point uh, in both regards there. Now, <clears throat> if you remember back to some of my initial notes where we were talking about like Japanese imperialism and how the Japanese high command was weighing out like the decision of whether they should attack Pearl Harbor or not because, you know, they were threatened because we had cut off their oil supply, all right? They end up doing the attack and they assumed that... <clears throat> America might likely win a long drawn out war, but they were hoping that they could cripple the American Pacific fleet with this sneak attack and that they, they thought it would be anywhere between nine months to a year and a half before America could get fully mobilized, make more ships, kind of repair our Navy and be ready to go on the offensive against them. But you also might remember the number one ship that they were trying to sink was our aircraft carriers. Uh, and luckily for us, we had four carriers out in the Pacific Fleet. None of them were at Pearl Harbor that day. Uh, that really throws a wrench in their plans because by saving those four aircraft carriers, that allowed us to actually go on kind of the offensive and strike back much, much sooner than Japan had been thinking. So the Battle of Midway, something that I don't have on the slide, or actually I do have it up there in the first point. This would be kind of a key thing. This takes place about six months after the Pearl Harbor attack. It's in June of 1942. And you remember, Pearl Harbor was attacked December 7th of 1941. So right at the very tail end of the year in 41. Now this is on into that next summer. <clears throat> the whole kind of scenario, what's been playing out for the last six months be between Pearl Harbor and Midway, Japan has been running amok. They have been conquering islands all over the Pacific. They've gobbled up those islands that have oil. They've taken a bunch of British and American territories. Uh, and then things kind of start to stall out for them in the Battle of Coral Sea. You didn't have to write any notes on that. You don't have to enter it. But the Battle of Coral Sea was Japanese carriers and a whole fleet was going to try to invade Australia. A couple of American uh, carriers and some British ones showed up and they have a massive battle. All sides take a lot of damage and both sides kind of retreat. So it was kind of like a stalemate battle. Anyway, though, I guess I would say it's more of a victory for us because it prevented them from taking Australia, which is a, a key piece of friendly territory for the Allies. Australia at the time was still part of the British Empire. So now we have that big base of operations and we can keep a lot of our supplies and stuff there. It'll be a staging point for the rest of the war in the Pacific. At this point though, Japan still thinks that they can go on the offensive and that America is not ready to fight back. <clears throat> but we actually are ready to start pursuing some like offensive strikes and ready to start throwing some punches. Another big advantage for America, and this is something that's not up on the slide, but I would recommend you make some sort of a note about this uh, on your history notes. <clears throat> America had cracked the Japanese codes. Now, this is before satellites. This is before the internet, uh, television, all that stuff. But radios do exist. And out on these big naval vessels, <clears throat> they have really high-powered uh, long or shortwave radios that can communicate hundreds of miles apart. So you can imagine, it, like, all sides created codes because they wanted to be able to communicate with people on their own team without the enemy knowing it. But as soon as you broadcast something out on the airwaves, really anybody with the correct radio technology can listen in on the message. Now, if it's properly coded, 
you, you're just, it's just going to sound like gibberish to you and you won't make any sense of it. Well, the Japanese didn't realize this, but we had cracked their codes and we were very hush hush and secret about it. So we we're actually listening in on their internal messages without them knowing it. This gives us a huge, huge advantage. Now they had not cracked our codes yet. And I'm going to get into what our kind of a little bit more info on our codes down the road, but that gives us a big advantage. Well, we realize <clears throat> that they still think that America is not capable of really fighting back yet. They think America is just in a defensive war and that they still have a few months to maybe even a year left where they're going to be able to just go out there and gobble up islands unchecked. Well, they have their sights on Midway Island. Midway was like an American territory. We have an American base there. It's a very, very tiny island, but it's strategically placed right in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Well, we try to, and I can't get into all the details of this because it would be a couple hour long you know, lecture video, uh, but we try to appear weak and make it seem like this is a really vulnerable base. And we basically try to entice them into attacking it, uh, doing a few different things. They take the bait. So a big Japanese fleet with four of their carriers and a bunch of battleships, cruisers, and other supply ships is going to make a push, and they're going to try to take that Midway Island out in the middle of the Pacific. Um, if they do that and capture that island, basically everything from Midway Island, the middle, all the way over to the far side of the Pacific where Japan is, would be their turf. Now, if you go past Midway Island towards America, the next big island chain you'd see is Hawaii. So if they take Midway, well, then Hawaii might be the next thing on their radar and they might even move in and try to take that. Um, so America, though, <clears throat> we were prepared for this. We wanted them to bring a big fleet in there because we still have four operational carriers. Uh, actually, one of those four had been really damaged badly in Coral Sea, but our Army Corps of Engineers, or the naval version of it, was able to repair that ship, and the Japanese thought that they had basically sunk it, and that one was out of commission, but we're able to miraculously kind of repair it and put it back in the fight. Uh, so we're gonna be kind of dead even. Now, another thing that I want you to put in here, and I think, I'm not sure if I have it up there. Oh yeah, I do, for the second point. Midway, uh, the Battle of Midway is going to be the first time in history where a whole bat massive naval battle happens and the fleets never even see each other. I mean, that kind of was the case in Pearl Harbor too, uh, but we weren't ready for it. It was a sneak attack. Now, this is the time where two fleets are going to come in and they're going to fight each other and they never even get closer than about 300 miles apart. It's an all aircraft carrier battle. Uh, so this kind of shows you how like battleships, the old ships that were very important in World War I and before, the ships with the really big guns, the cannons on it, uh, they've kind of become obsolete because they're still used. They still have some purpose but you think you could take out potentially a whole battleship with a couple planes from an aircraft carrier that can come in and hit them with torpedoes and bombs. Uh, so both sides have their carriers out there. The Japanese, though, they don't know that we're prepared for this. They have no idea that an American fleet is out there by Midway Island. And, and really kind of how the battle plays out for the first few days <clears throat> We send our planes up looking for the Japanese fleet. They send their planes up patrolling the area. We kind of know both fleets are out there, but nobody really knows where anybody's at. So remember, like today, that wouldn't happen because today we have satellites that are able to take really accurate pictures and, and see where things are at, like even out on the remote parts of the ocean. Back then, satellites didn't exist. So the only way to spot an enemy fleet out on the water was to go and like literally spot them and have a pilot or another ship put eyes on them. Uh, so really the first couple days of this battle is just kind of chaos and occasionally a few planes will, will come into contact with each other. There's some dog fights where two planes are fighting each other. Uh, a few ships get attacked here and there. <clears throat> But kind of luckily for us, uh, it, at, right in the nick of time, actually, the, the Japanese fleet was refueling their planes. Their planes had just come back in from looking for American ships, and they were making a, a switch. They were switching the planes from torpedoes to bombs, okay? So they're in a vulnerable position. Their planes are not armed up properly. They're in the process of changing them, and they're refueling their planes, so they have gasoline hoses all over the decks of the ships, and at that moment, which it takes about an hour to make that ship and or switch and fuel up your planes, 
Luckily, a squadron of American planes actually finds the Japanese fleet and starts coming in and dive bombing them and dropping bombs. Well, when you drop a bomb on the deck of an aircraft carrier and there's 20 gasoline hoses and a bunch of explosives out on the deck, what do you think that looks like? looks like the 4th of July fireworks show, right? I mean, these ships, like they go up in flames and they're very big, tough, durable ships. Uh, so none of them like sink right away, but we're able to cause massive damage to some of these Japanese carriers. Uh, I'm actually like just recently here, about two years ago, a great movie came out called Midway. If you're into history war movies at all, if you like like aircraft carrier stuff or things about World War II, I highly recommend you check that out. I don't have a full copy of the movie yet, um, but I am going to, to this post today, attach a few of the highlight scenes, kind of like the trailers from the movie and some of the best battle scenes where they're coming in and dive bombing these Japanese ships. I'm going to attach those on this post. So if you really like it, uh, I highly encourage you to go watch it. I think it is available out on a few different streaming apps. So, so look for that if you're into this kind of stuff. Um, anyway, we're able to cripple several of the Japanese carriers. This is a catastrophic loss for them because think about this. America is producing tons of ships right now. We have 20 times the production that Japan has. Uh, if we were to lose any of our carriers, which actually in the Battle of Midway, they, they did strike our ships a few times, but they didn't sink any of them or put them out of commission. So we actually lose none of our big ships. But even if we had lost some of our carriers, within another six months to a year, we're going to have new aircraft carriers coming out of our ports brand new ones ready to go and join the fight. Japan is in a totally different situation. They don't have as many factories. They can't produce as much stuff. So when Japan loses an aircraft carrier, a big ship like that, one of their, their absolute best weapons in the war, they're basically out of luck. And I think that at this point they had nine carriers in their uh, entire Navy. Four of them were in this battle, and we're going to take out two of them, plus a few other ships. So that's a huge loss to them. Um, and a very important thing for the Battle of Midway that I want you to get this in there, uh, and I'll move my face here now so you can kind of see this cool little image we got. Uh, <clears throat> another thing for you, the, the Battle of Midway is kind of the turning point in the war in the Pacific. Much like I told you that when we were talking about Europe last week in the Eastern Front, the Battle of Stalingrad was the furthest the German army got out. This epically big bloody battle happens and then the Russians start to push them back. That was kind of the turning point in the war. Uh, there's still a lot of war to go, but now the Allies are pushing Germany back. The same is true about the Battle of Midway uh, for the Pacific theater of the war. This was the last time in the war, the Battle of Midway, that the J Japanese fleet went on the attack. It's also the first time in the war that the Americans swing and land a punch back and we decisively win a battle. Uh, basically for the rest of the war from, from halfway through June of 1942 on into August of 1945 when they surrender, now it's going to be a slow, steady series of American victories in the Pacific. We're going to steadily, decisively beat the Japanese and push them back closer and closer to Japan. So there's still years of war to happen. There's going to be many, many bloody battles, but uh, this is the beginning of the end for the Japanese Empire. Uh, and America really starts to, to come back, and it's much sooner than the Japanese expected. Another thing that makes this battle so impressive, and if you ever watch the whole movie of Midway, they talk about this quite extensively. Uh, at this point in the war, 1942, the American ships are basically, most of them are older. They're getting phased out and we're producing brand new ships. The same is true for the American planes. Our planes were older models. We had, we kind of got in the war unexpectedly. Uh, so a hundred percent, the Japanese ships and the Japanese planes, those Mitsubishi Zeros are all better than our equipment. Not saying their pilots are better or they're better trained, but they just have better equipment than America does. When you fast forward a year after this, by 1943, uh, now all of the new American uh, stuff, weapons of war that we're producing are coming out of our factories and all of the new upgrades, the new versions of planes and ships we're making are going to be superior to what Japan has. Uh, so that very much tips things in our favor too. Hopefully you found this interesting. It's a very epically important battle, kind of a shifting point in the war. Uh, next up, I really don't have an assignment for you to do today, but I do want you to watch the, the video clips that I attached to this post too. I think you'll find them interesting. And if you're a war buff at all, 
it's probably going to make you want to go track down this movie and watch the whole thing, which I highly recommend. It's a top-notch movie. Uh, definitely one of the top 10 World War II movies I've ever seen. So take care. Have a good day. See you tomorrow.